thank you very much for accommod accommodating the um, Southern Hemisphere uh, time zones. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, when um, Astrid first invited me, we were rather horrified to discover that the um, original time slot, I believe was about two o'clock in the morning. Um, so 6, 6 p.m. here is much more, um, much more reasonable. Um, I'm really excited to give this talk today because I'm really hoping that you guys are my target audience. And this is the first time that I've presented this work externally. So it's hot off the press. Uh, New, newly minted, and I'm really excited to have some, some feedback from people who are really familiar with museum specimens and museum genomics, because uh, I'm hoping the work that we're, uh, we're doing within my team is going to be really impactful. So I'm going to start just by um, talking, telling you a little bit about me. Now, I don't normally put pictures of myself in seminars, but I find staring at thumbnails can be a little bit impersonal. impersonal. Uh, so as um, Astrid introduced, I'm a senior research scientist at the Australian National Wildlife Collection in Canberra. Um, the leader of the temporal epigenomics group there and a member of what's called the Environomics Future Science Platform, which is something that is a strategic initiative that is attempting to develop new platform technology to study biodiversity. Uh, I mean, obviously in Australia, but hopefully globally. My research interests um, are fairly varied, but I describe myself generally as an applied evolutionary geneticist. I'm definitely an expert in rec reptile sex determination. And from my work in the epigenetic, uh, the study of temperature dependent sex determination, I've got a really strong interest in looking at gene environment interactions generally. And I, I guess that's how I describe myself as becoming an accidental epigeneticist. Uh, because it was looking at how the, the questions around how the environment can regulate uh, and affect gene expression and affect phenotypes was sort of how I got into, into epigenetics as, a, as an area. So the Australian National Wildlife Collection is based in Canberra, uh, which is Australia's capital city, which people may not necessarily know because everyone goes, oh, isn't Sydney Australia's capital city? It isn't actually. Um, Sydney is Australia's largest city, but it is not the capital. Uh, Canberra is the place where all the politicians live. And it is, of course, uh, home to a large portion of the National Science Agency. This is my home, the Australian National Wildlife Collection, which is the vertebrate part of the national collections. It's got a bit of um, a humble entrance at the moment there, although there are several large uh, vaults out the back. But I'm pleased to tell you that we are in the process of building a, uh, a much more fantastic uh, entrance and certainly less humble. Uh, but this is going to be a new national collections building in Canberra that's going to centralise all of our um, collections into uh, one spot, one precinct. But at the moment, this is this is what our new building looks like. So we're still a little bit, um, got a bit to go there. So the National Research Collections uh, at, that are housed by CSIRO, the National Science Agency, are you know, fairly large by Australian standards. We're perhaps not competing with the European institutions, but we're holding over 15 million specimens. There are seven major, um, seven major collections within the National Research Collections. The Wildlife Collection, which is exclusively terrestrial vertebrates. The Fish Collection, which is of course the non-terrestrial vertebrates. Insect Collection, Herbarium, Tropical Herbarium, Tree Seed Center. Uh, and also interestingly, we have a living collection which is the um, algal collection and indeed the tree seed center has a few living, uh, living viable seeds as well. So we've got quite a range of specimens and collections. The Australian National Wildlife Collection holds all of the regular um, vertebrate materials such as eggs, skins, pelts, um, bones, and of course, formal and fixed specimens, which is going to be the primary 
um, the primary objects, collection objects that we're going to be talking about today. And that brings me, I guess, to the main part of my talk now, which is about museum epigenomics. And I'm going to be describing to you chromatin accessibility over the last century and how you get at this information in museum specimens. This work has been uh, ongoing for quite some time now as part of this strategic investment in um, developing tools to study biodiversity. And what I'm going to do today is present two complementary uh, chromatin accessibility assays that we've developed. And I believe that this is really the first look that we can have into historical gene expression. And yes, we've been working on this for, for about six years now, and I just want to acknowledge my excellent team. Uh, and in particular, I want to highlight Yuri Stiller, who has been uh, instrumental in the bioinformatics analysis of the, the data that we've generated, as well as Erin Hahn, who is my postdoc, and she is a, a literal and meta metaphorical superstar who's been selected for this uh, nationally important campaign within Australia to highlight women in science. So to start off, before we launch into epigenetics as a concept, I'm going to play a short video just to sort of help everyone visualise what I'm talking about, because epigenomic regulation is really all about, uh, I guess, the, the 3D, 3D landscape. And it's hard to imagine. Um, so these visuals are going to hopefully give you a bit of a, a grounding in what we're talking about as we move through the talk. And I am going to kind of pinpoint um, some still images and refer back to this video so that people can keep oriented in the genome and the epigenetic landscape as I, as I talk. So invariably, whenever I tell someone that I'm working on epigenetics, the very first response is, ah, methylation. And I don't want to um, you know, say anything bad about methylation. It is indeed a very important uh, epigenetic mechanism, but it is only one. So methylation of the cytosines are usually repressive, sometimes not, um, but there are other parts to um, and other epigenetic modifications that are important. And the ones that I'm interested in and going to be talking about today are histone, uh, interested in histone modifications. So there's methylation of the histone modifications, acetylation of histone, mod of histone tails rather, phosphorylation. So it's, it's rather a lot more complicated than just one thing. And really the point of all of these, um, these epigenetic modifications is to alter the chromatin landscape and change the accessibility of uh, the DNA to the proteins that need to access it. So the transcription factors, uh, the transcriptional machinery, the DNA polymerases, really have to have physical access to the DNA to um, upregulate and downregulate genes. So instead of looking at one particular type of modification, you know, be it a, a histone modification, of some sort, DNA methylation, and sort of just hoping that that particular modification is going to be the one that is associated with the phenotype that we're interested in. Really what we've done is we've taken a different approach and gone straight to the end product and said, what have all of these modifications done to the, the chromatin landscape? How accessible is it uh, to the transcriptional machinery? And that's what we're going to be looking at um, to study epigenetics in museum specimens. And so we're going to do this by using these two methods that my team and I have developed together. And we've called them, they're basically sort of opposing uh, uh, methods. They give complementary information. So there's archival closed chromatin sequencing where you are sequencing the part of uh, the genome that has been really tightly coiled and is inaccessible to the transcriptional machinery. So that it's going to be focusing on closed chromatin areas. And then there is the open chromatin areas. 
So these are the accessible parts. These are going to be associated with things that are actively being expressed. And really we're hoping with the combination of these two things, you're gonna get a good understanding of, of what's going on in terms of the, the chromatin architecture. So how do we do this? Um, obviously we are um, thinking about things a bit laterally in my team. And so we started looking at epigenetic techniques and notice that really one of the very first steps in most epigenetic techniques is to apply formaldehyde and deliberately cross-link the DNA and the proteins before you conduct your epigenetic assay. And we got to thinking, well, you know, we've got a whole vault full of things that have been exposed to formaldehyde by another way, by another name, formalin, which is um, has the, the formaldehyde constituent in it. And maybe, maybe just maybe, formalin exposure is not in fact an impediment to molecular analysis. Maybe it's actually a tool. And so we really turned this assumption on its head and sort of thought, let's go about this from, you know, from, the, from, the, from scratch and think about this differently. What if formalin is actually preserving a molecular signal. So we think, and you know, this was the hypothesis we started out with, that the, chrome, the formaldehyde and formalin exposure of our, uh, to our specimens was gonna take us basically a snapshot of the chromatin accessibility at the point of capture or indeed preservation. And if so, we can potentially then get at gene expression and also, if true, this is really a unique advantage that is held by museums because we are going to be the one holding uh, a handful of snapshots of historical uh, chromatin accessibility. So we decided to explore this and, it, and as I said, it has been a long, uh, long road, six years so far. Um, and we had to take a bit of a, a circuitous path to get here because Many of you may already know that until just recently, where ourselves and a number of other groups have published, it was pretty much thought impossible to get even DNA from a formal and preserved historical specimen in a museum. Um, and that, you know, when we told people we were looking for epigenetic signals in formal and preserved specimens, they pretty much thought we were crazy. Um, so the first thing that we had to do was prove that you could in fact get whole genome level data, good quality, well, good is a, a relative word, but good, you know, good enough to assemble a, um, assemble a genome at, a, at whole genome scale from formal and preserved specimens. And so we did this by combining the strengths of the ancient DNA field, which deals with quite degraded DNA and medical genomics, which are regularly dealing with uh, formal and fixed paraffin embedded pathological material, uh, tumors and the like. So by combining these two things, we've come up with um, several method, uh, method um, where you can sequence whole genomes from formal and preserved specimens. So we've proven that you can get DNA. Now we have to figure out how to get at, get at our epigenetic signal. So if you're interested in just the whole, whole genome sequencing work that is published uh, in Molecular Ecology Resources, it's available online at the moment. So if you're interested in that, maybe just check it out because we're actually we're not really gonna be talking about that work today. We're gonna be talking about the epigenetic work. So, the first thing we did is we had a look at our whole genome sequencing data. And it was at this point, my postdoc and Erin and I looked at it and went, that's a very odd pattern in the reads, in the aligned data from our whole genome sequencing. It's made us very suspicious um, that there were these peaks. It was not uniform coverage from our sequencing. It was very regular, it was very reproducible between individuals and indeed across years. So you can see here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but this is uh, different individuals all the way from 1905 until 2001. And there is this very regular spaced pattern of peaks and troughs. 
And we got very suspicious when we saw this, especially when we noticed that the interval between these peaks is pretty much exactly the size of a nucleosome. And we went, ha ha, there is a signal. So to give you a little bit more detail about that, uh, we you know, really wanted to sort of have a look. And this is a, a nucleosome, um, a closed chromatin nucleosome profiling uh, method using MNAs digestion that people use in, in medical science all the time. This is the sort of thing that you would expect if you are intending to get information about the uh, nucleosome patterns in your DNA sequence. So you digest it and it comes out with these, these peaks and troughs. And um, this is our data for comparison. So it's not exactly the same, but we are seeing these, these regular peaks and it was enough to get our interest peaked. So what we found and we've hypothesized is that basically when you expose um, you know, a mouse or a, a bearded dragon, for example, to form formaldehyde, what happens is that you snapshot in, you fix hard the chromatin structure, and then what happens over the period of storage as it's sitting on the shelf in, in our vaults is that the DNA begins to degrade and the areas that are heavily cross-linked, so the ones that are in contact and close to tightly coiled with the nucleosomes are going to be really heavily cross-linked and they're actually going to be degrading at a different rate than the things that are open in open chromatin. So you can see here, we've got things that are in contact with the nucleosomes are degrading at a slow rate. Things that are open and actively, potentially actively expressed are degrading faster. And you have this regular pattern of slow, fast, slow, fast degradation. So to exacerbate this signal basically, which is sort of, you know, the museum specimens are handily sitting on the shelf doing the assay for us, but we really wanted to exacerbate that signal and see if we can uh, increase the signal to noise ratio. We applied a really, really rough uh, DNA extraction method to extract the DNA. It's called a hot alkaline DNA extraction where we put the, uh, the basically digest the, the tissue in a alkaline buffer it was about pH 12, I think maybe 13. And then you autoclave it for um, 20 minutes. So treat it very, very roughly. So we're exacerbating, um, I guess, artificially aging our, our DNA in the hopes of revealing this chromatin structure. And we've also subsequently tried to exacerbate that even more with the addition of MNAs, which is a, a DNA digesting enzyme. So, so basically we've got natural degradation, we've got in vitro degradation and the open and closed parts of the chromatin are degrading at different rates, creating these lovely, lovely humps. So if you remember back to the video, what that means is that when you then sequence that just with whole shotgun sequencing, you preferentially sequence the things that are in contact with the nucleosomes here. And these are the bits that have basically been blasted away uh, during this um, rough DNA extraction and the natural process of degradation in the vault. So here's another, uh, another example um, of our pattern, but it's where we're now starting to consider whether or not we can use this to infer something about gene expression. So this is a gene um, that is not expressed in the tissue that we had investigated. So the tissue we were looking at was liver. And this is a gene that we are expecting should not be expressed in a liver tissue. And what we see upstream of the gene in a putative regulatory region is a huge buildup of uh, peaks, which is indicative of closed chromatin. It is highly regular. It is the predicted distance between nucleosomes, 150 base pairs. It is reproducible both within and between individuals and it is stable across time. Basically, this is the signal of a hard off. So we're confident, we we're very pleased when we saw this because we're like, yes, this is exactly what we would predict for a gene that is not expressed in this tissue. But figuring out which things are off is not necessarily that exciting. What we want to do 
is look at things that are being expressed and whether or not that is changing over time. So this is just some preliminary, um, preliminary data and it is only one individual versus uh, another individual at this point. We are working on upping our replication. And then this is just indicative of the type of analysis that we'll be discussing. So this, ge this gene, FBXL4 uh, rather, is expressed in liver. And so we still see a, um, a bunch of reads that are going to be upstream in a putative uh, regulatory region upstream of the gene. But what we're starting to see is really the, I guess the dynamic nature of chromatin accessibility coming into play. It's not all the same. It's not like the hard off signal. Some things are up, some things are down. And so what we can see then is that there are parts of this regulatory region that are changing. And so this um, blue trace down here is a summary and a comparison of these two individuals. So you can see here that uh, this peak is much, much higher than this peak. So that is summarized by a peak on this side, the 1905 side saying it's, it's higher in 1905 significantly than the 2001 sample. And so this is the signal that we see when things are becoming more accessible over time. Alternatively, in the same regulatory region, we also see the signal of parts of it becoming less accessible. So things are changing, it's dynamic. So we have here, the small peak in 1905 is becoming larger in 2001. And so this part of our uh, regulatory region is becoming less accessible over time. So it is, um, yeah, having more of that closed chromatin signal in the modern, more modern specimen. So this is interesting to see these trends going on. Uh, we are in the process of trying to figure out what it means, but this particular gene is a gene that is associated with the uh, innate immunity and response to pathogenic challenges. So it, you know, we are aware that in this, sam this um, sample, they have been, the population has been exposed to a new pathogen and potentially there is some change in gene regulation associated with that exposure. So, so that's our first method, uh, which is focusing on the closed chromatin profiling, but we also wanted to do the opposite. And that, that comes to our uh, open chromatin assay, again, starting with our formal and fixed specimen. And we use the, um, the fact that there is protein bound and non-protein bound parts of uh, the, the DNA. So basically here, what we're doing is using the, the formal and fixation to bind the DNA part, the parts of the DNA that are associated with nucleosomes. So they are associated with proteins. And then we separate it on the basis of whether or not you are protein bound or not protein bound. And, to, and then it basically comes out telling, telling you which parts of the genome are in open chromatin and which parts are not. So going back to our figure before, instead of um, sequencing the closed chromatin, which is in contact with the nucleosome, what we're doing is using that protein protein cross-linking and pro binding to the protein to eliminate that from our um, DNA template for sequencing. And we're gonna be focusing on this part right here in between that is not protein bound. And we're gonna be enriching for open chromatin and potentially expressed regions of the genome instead. So we have done some preliminary work on this and what we would expect to see basically is uh, if you've done a, a survey for open chromatin successfully, you would expect to see across the, the genome that there is an enrichment uh, of reads around the transcription start site of genes at a uh, basically a genome wide level. So this is our expectation, basically. So this funnel-like plot that we have, if your enrichment for open chromatin is successful, this is not our data, this is data from a uh, biomedical study. If your open chromatin enrichment is successful, you expect a funnel 
showing that you are sequencing, you know, preferentially something around the start of a gene, basically. So that's what we expected to see. And so we, we did our archival open chromatin technique and we hoped to see a funnel, uh, but what came out was a bit unexpected. So we didn't see a funnel at all. What we actually saw was something that kind of looked like a, a mirror, I guess a mirror image. It was almost like the, there is an absence of reads at the right at the transcription start site. So we've you know, kind of done the opposite of what we, was ex we were expecting. And we had to take a bit of a step back at this point and go, okay, this is interesting. Um, yeah, there's this suspicious absence of reads or what we've been calling an anti-peak sitting right at the transcription start site. Now that can't be, uh, can't be a coincidence. Why is there a depletion of reads at the right at the transcription start site? What's going on? So we thought about what our assay did and what, um, what could explain this signal. And we went back to our, our lovely image and thought about it. So what we're really doing is depleting parts of the genome that are in contact with proteins. And we realized that when a gene is actively expressed, it is in fact in contact with a protein. It's just not in contact with the nucleosomes. So you can see here this large RNA polymerase and the transcription factors are all proteins and they are all closely associated with active, actively expressed open chromatin. And we're like, hmm, is this it? We need to do an experiment. Um, this was our hypothesis, right? So we thought, well, the main difference between a medical type assay for open chromatin and what we're doing is that there is insane levels of formaldehyde exposure. So in the medical world, if you want to enrich for open chromatin, you expose uh, your DNA to formaldehyde. I think it's about, you know, 2% for maybe 10 minutes. But our museum specimens have been exposed in some cases to formaldehyde for, you know, usually an unknown amount of time, but it can be anywhere. It can be months, it could be years. Um, usually a lot more than we would be expecting uh, under, in a medical assay. So we propose that this high exposure and intense prolonged exposure to formaldehyde induces really, really, really heavy cross-linking across the genome. And it's capturing more DNA protein interactions than we thought. And that this is what's what's resulting in the depletion of active promoters. So this gives you a bit of a, a, a summary here on the right, that we're depleting for these protein bound nucleosome, protein bound nucleosome regions, but where the transcriptional machinery is actively interacting with the DNA, we've also captured that too and pulled it down out of our sequencing data. So Erin did a, a very elegant experiment in yeast um, because they're a little bit easier to handle and cheaper to sequence. Um, but we posed the question to go, look, if we, if we overfix something, do we deplete, um, do we deplete our reads near the transcription start site? And so we, what we were expecting is if, if this is true, as you increase the concentration and the exposure of formaldehyde in a sample, then there should be basically a transition where you've gone from a standard fair type assay that you would see in the medical community with a peak at the regulatory region that would eventually split into two peaks because you have captured that DNA protein interaction at the, um, with the transcriptional machinery. Basically, you're just increasing, every time you increase the exposure and the concentration of formaldehyde, you are capturing more and more of those and pulling down DNA protein interactions. And that is what we saw. Uh, bearing in mind that this is an experiment occurred over 24 hours, it has not occurred on the scale of time uh, that museum specimens are going to be operating on. But I think this is supportive of our hypothesis that when you have light exposure to formaldehyde, you have one peak, you increase it, things start to change, 
And as you are over and over fixing, fixing really heavily, you start to then see two peaks because we are depleting in the middle of that single peak for the extra DNA protein interactions. And so what we realized then is that this is actually really cool because we can distinguish not only between open and closed uh, chromatin, we can actually differentiate between three different states of chromatin accessibility. Because you've got to remember that all actively expressed genes are going to be in open chromatin, but not all open chromatin is actively expressed. And now we have a signal that is informative about active expression. So what we've proposed is that using these combination of these two assays and the different types of signals that we might be seeing, we can certainly characterize the region, regions of the genome that are in closed chromatin. We can also characterize the regions of the genome that are open, poised for expression, but not actively expressed. And we can also, using our anti-peak signal, where we're uh, seeing two peaks instead of one in our um, open chromatin data, we can pull out which genes are actively expressed as well. And as I'm sure most people on this call know, when you're working with um, museum data of any kind, museum genetic data, it's often very noisy. So having these complementary assays that inform each other means that we can be now really accurately get a picture of genome-wide historical chromatin maps, ideally at a single nucleosome level of resolution. And so we're pretty excited about this new capability. So now that we're confident about it, what we're trying to do is reach out to people such as yourselves to talk about how we could potentially use these techniques to answer important questions. We have three active case studies. That's actually three now. We're, we're branching out, uh, going both with internal and external collaborators. We've starting to publish um, publish our work in, in journals, and this is going to be submitted very, very soon. We're offering this, yeah, really unique perspective of temporal gene expression and spruiking the, the value of collections for insight into the past. Yeah, doing talks like this, trying to get it out through media and popular communication channels as well. So, um, and convey our enthusiasm. So I'm just going to talk briefly now about some of the work that we've been doing, actually implementing these, uh, these techniques to answer real questions, because it's very methodological up until now. How do we use it? What sort of things can we do? So we have an active um, collaboration with Celine Frere. She works in Eastern Water Dragons. And um, what she's interested in is understanding the capacity and the progress of rapid adaptation to uh, urbanization. And a lot of things have changed in Brisbane over the last um, over the last 150 years or so. Uh, but what we're really hoping to help her with is look at not only the genomic change, but the epigenomic change. And we can hopefully, uh, by increasing that sampling, understand not only just whether things are changing on and off, but we can look at the mode of change, the tempo of the change, whether it's going fast or slow, the directionality, whether things are being turned on or off. And the reason we're interested in these dragons is because she has an excellent modern data set already um, very, very uh, extensively characterizing the fact that these lizards are modifying their behavior, their morphology is changing in different parts of the cities. There is a outbreak of a new novel pathogen, a fungal pathogen similar to uh, chytrid fungus, and that there is significant uh, genetic differentiation of basically no gene flow between these populations. So she refers to them as um, urban archipelagos. So we've worked with her. We have tried sequencing from 32 individuals, only 13 were sampled, but 40% is not bad because it included one from 1905. We've been able to recover um, very high cover mitochondrial genomes, 
it's more challenging with large genome sizes to get um, whole genome coverage for SNP calling, but we're working on that. Uh, so this gives you a bit of a snapshot of uh, how many are in the collection on the left, those red dots, this the collections that are available to us. And the, on the right are the specimens that we have currently, currently looked at. And this is an example of some of our data, and it's also a comparison of two of our closed chromatin assays that we're actively improving on. So the top panels, um, the top panels here, the hot alkaline lysis, are the straight hot alkaline lysis sequencing. And so you can see that there is that regular, uh, regular pattern. It's a little bit patchy. Uh, we wanted to improve on that. And so this is how, uh, when we incorporated the addition of an MNA's digestion, which is indeed what people in the medical community do to assay closed chromatin. And again, our hypothesis was if this signal is real, digestion of MNA's, uh, digestion with MNA's of our archival DNA should improve the signal uh, of nucleosome structure, and indeed it did. So you can see that the complexity of these libraries is significantly improved uh, and the coverage of the genome has improved. So we're again excited about this because basically surveying for chromatin accessibility uh, is the same thing as actually also increasing your whole genome, the complexity of your whole genome sequencing. So it's kind of a win-win uh, for both methods. Again, going back to um, just kind of starting to understand the peak morphology in these specimens, we're now in the process of developing some pipelines to summarise change and also just make sure and sort of ground truth our signal. This is um, an example of our four, four individuals. And again, I'm sure all of the, all of the geneticists on, on this seminar will know that when you sequence a genome, you don't get even coverage, even if it's a modern specimen. So one of the very first things that we really wanted to make sure was that we weren't just, sequen weren't just experiencing sequencing bias and that we weren't, um, I guess, making something out of nothing. So what this particular analysis with DanPOS software does is it compares the reads from our archival MNAs treated specimens, which we're anticipating is gonna be informative about chromatin structure, compares it to whole genome non-archival sequencing from the same species, and it basically subtracts the difference. And you can see that there are effects basically of uh, you know, variation in, in genome coverage. You can see underneath the gene and a little bit upstream, there's sort of small wobbles um, in genome coverage, sometimes up, sometimes down. This is basically what we would consider the background, uh, the background noise to our assay. But you'll also notice that basically there is a really strong signal once we've corrected for differences in sequencing coverage. There's a strong signal. There's always enrichment upstream of the transcription start site. And this is really where we're going to start looking for our, our putative regulatory elements. We've also been looking at other ways to potentially ground truth what we're looking at, again, to make sure that uh, we're seeing what we're seeing is real. We're looking for biological signal. So here we compared the DANPOS enrichment profiles between the two different sexes. And the caveat being at this point, we only unfortunately have one female individual. But what we did see was that there was a strong uh, influence in the DANPOS profile between males and females now. This is in liver tissue. And so some of you might say, well, what's, what's, why, would a, why, would, would, why is a male liver different to a female liver? And the answer I give to that is that this is consistent with cell auton autonomous sex, so that there is an inherent cell identity in all tissues within reptiles. Uh, it's certainly known for birds. It's not specifically observed in this species, but I would say that this is, you know, it's likely and it's it's consistent with us, the signal we would expect if there was cell autonomous sex. The last thing we did to um, really ground truth and start to understand our data was to look at whether or not there was any correlation between read depth 
uh, the read depth enrichment that we're seeing and gene expression, because if you're uh, getting lots more reads in uh, regions that are expressed, then you should see a correlation between uh, expression and the read depth. And we did see this, it's a fairly messy, um, fairly messy relationship, but basically we're only expecting there to be a strong signal of chromatin accessibility in this treatment that's in the box, which is the formalin fixed MNAs treated um, specimens. And the R squared is, is positive, the slope is positive, it is significant. And in the other specimens, we're not seeing the same type of correlation. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'll quickly share with you without going into a huge amount of detail, the other pieces of work that we're collaborating on. We're looking at uh, historical population genetics with um, another postdoc from ANWC, David Thwo. He is in looking at the great desert skink. Um, that picture doesn't give you the scale of it. It's kind of, you know, a very, very, you know, they don't call it the great desert skink for no reason. It's very large and it is culturally significant to the indigenous people. This, uh, this lizard occurs out in Uluru and it is, um, yes, of great, great significance and, and conservation importance. That also means that you can't sample them. You can't trap them. They're too significant. So we've gone back into the collections and we've extracted um, from 36 individuals from 1960 and 34 of them worked very well. Best result we've got so far, largest insert sizes, highest success rate. So we're excited about that and because that's gonna provide a, um, a background for him to compare his eDNA captured modern samples. We're also looking at uh, questions of industry significance. Uh, we've got a collaboration with Peter Grew from Oceans and Atmosphere who works in fisheries, uh, fisheries science. So he works on the Atlantic bluefin tuna and he wants to look at questions about provenance and uh, the stock identity of the commercial fisheries. And we did this using um, some formal and preserved historical larvae. So these weren't sort of technically museum specimens, they were from a collection from um, uh, just surveys from, um, from industry. So the picture of that larvae doesn't give you uh, the sense of scale. And I think that this is the example of Erin being basically a DNA magician. That historical larvae, formal and preserved, can be sucked up with a one mil pipette tip without cutting the end off. It is one to two millimeters big, uh, basically invisible. And she has successfully managed to get uh, DNA and prepare libraries. And we have confirmed that these are in fact the Atlantic bluefin tuna just today. The reason that we want to do this is because Peter Grew is really worried about the management of Atlantic bluefin tuna because they have to make a decision about whether or not the Gulf of Mexico, the two major stocks are one, one population or two. And basically it makes a big difference because if you think, if you're in the Gulf of Mexico, you can fish harder if you think that there are going to be fish coming in from the Mediterranean population. So if you go make the wrong decision, go too hard, you could basically collapse the $8 million industry. So it's really important to get accurate information about whether or not uh, these decisions are correct. And we're gonna do that by tracking temporal gene flow because we've gone about 20 years uh, into the past with these larvae. Lastly, uh, I'm just going to mention quickly that we've got a number of ongoing projects and development with my postdocs, my, I call them fearless early career researchers. Marina Alexander is now working on a project with me to conduct RNA sequencing from bat specimens and we're going to be investigating uh, the potential for disease spillovers and RNA, you know, especially anchored viral biodiversity using formal and preserved specimens. 
And Erin has decided that doing invisible tuna is not challenge enough. And she is now going to be doing an eDNA approach, looking at meta barcoding from the preservation media itself, not actually the specimens to look for evidence of parasites within our collection. So I guess basically to wrap things up, what we're really hoping is that the historical epigenetic techniques that I've discussed today are going to be providing a, you know, a brand new uh, implement in the toolkit to respond to environmental challenges. We have for the first time now, the ability to go back in time and look at the before state of populations in terms of gene expression, uh, prior to the horrific um, you know, environmental calamities that seem to be occurring at a regular rate these days. And, and Canberra has been particularly hard hit by this over the last three years. You can see the golf balls of hail, which destroyed 30 years of, of greenhouse work at CSIRO. We very nearly caught on fire, as did the entire east coast of Australia just before COVID hit. We are now currently underwater in a large portion of the eastern seaboard due to excessive rain. The fires, it was um, apocalyptic um, during the, the black summer and extreme heat waves and, and coronavirus. So we're basically suffering an onslaught of environmental challenges right now. And we're really hoping uh, that this toolkit and indeed what we're calling our epigenetic time machine is going to be capable of addressing some of those challenges to Australia's biodiversity. Thank you.